Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar, the channel where you can learn about new concepts in physics and astronomy. I am your host, Dr. Robitaille. Today we're going to talk about the scientific history of the Sun. Astronomers believe that the Sun's surface is an optical illusion and that the solar body is nothing but a big ball of gaseous plasma. Of course, these ideas are never challenged and almost no one understands how we got to that point. Our model of the Sun is important because it leads to our understanding of other star types, the universe, and how it was formed. We are going to address all of this and more on Sky Scholar. If you like heavy reading, I've already addressed the scientific history of the Sun in these two papers. You should read them if you like to learn more. Now some of you might wonder why we are looking at history instead of cutting-edge astrophysics. In this case, it helps us to see why we view the Sun today as a ball of gas from the surface all the way down to the core. Now the body of the Sun was already con considered gaseous in 1865, but back then there was no observational evidence that it was a gas. In fact, I haven't seen any evidence to this day. If you were to take a university course in solar physics, you would not be provided with a single observation proving that the body of the Sun is a gaseous plasma. Rather, since the Sun is believed to be composed primarily of hydrogen, a hydrogen-based plasma consisting of free electrons and protons would be invoked without any consideration of the alternatives. It would be argued that the Sun could be treated as an ideal gas and the associated mathematical treatment would commence right away. So why do we think of the Sun as a gas? In part, it is a question of tradition. We have thought so for 150 years. But perhaps more importantly, it is because of the math. Scientists love mathematics, and if we can apply these methods to a system, we usually gain a lot of understanding. The truth is that the mathematical methods can be easily applied to gases, Yet if the Sun is not a gas, but rather comprised of something else, then all our current mathematical models would become useless and difficult or perhaps impossible to replace. In any case, how did we get to a gaseous Sun? Let's start with William Herschel at the beginning of the 19th century. Herschel believed that the Sun was an inhabited solid object. He was a careful observer who made many important discoveries. You can tell he loved the stars since he built more than 400 telescopes himself. He also had a vivid imagination. Herschel's sun was populated with strange beings, which he called solarians. In his mind, the photosphere was like a cloud, floating above the true solar surface. The strong light of the sun came from these clouds. The idea makes some sense if you think of the Earth and its atmosphere. Sunspots on the sun were like clouds here on Earth. In his mind, sunspots permitted him to view the surface of the sun upon which his solarians lived. However, Herschel soon recognized that the photosphere was extremely hot and could harm his solarians. To protect his aliens, he added a second layer of clouds between the photosphere and the solid surface. Placing reflective clouds above their heads, Herschel could shield his solarians from the intense heat of the photosphere. This is an example of how scientists can easily fit fantasy to facts. It would not take much more imagination to make the entire sun a gas. Fifty years after Herschel introduced solarians, Herbert Spencer in 1858 became the first to propose that the body of the sun was gaseous in nature. Completely inverting the ideas of William Herschel, Spencer modeled the sun much like a balloon. He treated the interior as a gas and placed the photosphere on a rigid surface. He believed this surface was composed of condensed matter. In physics, when we say condensed matter, we mean solids or liquids. Spencer was not an astronomer. He is best known as an early evolutionist. He was a very controversial figure in his day, especially since most scientists of the period were opposed to any ideas which might be viewed as a challenge to authority. In any case, Spencer's solar ideas were never accepted by the scientific community. Though he was clearly the first to propose a gaseous sun, he remained ignored. Still, the most prominent astronomers of the period knew of his work. 
Soon after Spencer, in 1864, an Italian named Father Angelo Secchi made the next big leap in solar modeling. Secchi was the head of the Vatican Observatory. His ideas about the constitution of the sun were later copied by the Frenchman Hervé Fay, who was also a statesman. Both Secchi and Fay were recognized throughout Europe as leaders in astronomy. They viewed the sun much like Spencer, but rather than adopt a condensed solar surface, they thought of the photosphere as being composed of clumps of solid or liquid matter, which floated on top of inferior solar clouds. So we have to ask, why did Secchi and Fay want to have condensed matter floating on top of clouds? The answer was because they believed that the white light emitted by our solar surface could only be produced by condensed matter. In the laboratory, scientists already knew that gases could not emit a continuous spectrum. Hervé Fay said it best. But the incandescent solids and liquids alone give a continuous spectrum, while the gases or vapors supply but a spectrum reduced to only a few luminous rays. What was Hervé Fay saying in plain English? Here is the spectrum of atomic hydrogen. Note that the gaseous hydrogen emits in narrow bands, whereas the solar spectrum from the photosphere is continuous. We will cover this in greater detail in a later video. For now, remember that in Secchi and Fay's case, the white light of the sun could only be produced by condensed matter. In the end, they were correct, but astronomy sidestepped this requirement. One year later, in 1865, Delarue, Stewart, and Lowry, without any experimental evidence, proposed that the continuous white light of the sun could be produced by a fully gaseous atmosphere. They were quickly endorsed by Franklin and Lockyer, the founder of the journal Nature. Thus, by 1865, the sun had become completely gaseous for many leading astronomers. In time, the mathematical theories would be formulated to complement these ideas. Using the ideal gas law and the principle of hydrostatic equilibrium, scientists would be able to build models of the sun without any need for condensed matter. In an 1865 paper, Faye had already argued that the sun did not have a real surface. After all, Secchi and Fay viewed the sun as a ball of gas, and since gases cannot have a surface, Fay was free to argue the point. So there you have it. In the minds of many astronomers, the sun could not have a surface. Theory became more important than observation, and though many observational astronomers of the period disagreed, the sun lost its surface. You will learn in later presentations that there is plenty of evidence and proof that the sun has a real surface. It is definitely not an optical illusion as is currently claimed. Even if you are not a scientist, you will be able to understand for yourself these pieces of evidence and solid proofs that the sun has a true surface. Later videos will look closely at the standard model and outline its problems. Remember that the observation that remains the most important is that the photosphere of the sun can emit white light and represents a true surface. The production of this light is the Achilles heel of the standard solar model. The consequences are significant not only for our sun and the stars, but also for ideas closer to home. I hope that you like this short history of the gaseous sun and will join me as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. If you enjoyed this video, please leave the like. In addition, subscribe if you want to journey with me through space here at Sky Scholar. Questions and comments are always welcome down below. I'll see you soon on our next video.